All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Chasing Edges podcast. I am your host, Mike Rattol, alongside my co-host, Cole Bardreau and Nate Van Cowenberg. Um, good to have you boys back. Welcome back for episode two. What's up? Fire How we doing? You. Doing good, doing good. Uh, before we start, um, I think on behalf of the the three of us here, we want to just take a second to to really thank the listeners who took the time to subscribe to the podcast, listen to the podcast, follow us on our social media pages. Um, the response that we got from episode one was kind of overwhelming. I don't know if I thought we would get the viewership and the listens that we did. Um, you know, and I think it's uh, it's more of a credit to Nate and Cole, but. Uh, I think we we're really grateful for everybody who listened and we're excited for you guys to follow us along on this journey. And we hope that the content we bring you week to week is something that you can really connect to and really focus on and and follow us along on this path. Um, So before we get into episode two, just want to kind of see what's up. Cole, how was the last week? How's the training gone? You're getting closer to the season. How's that been going? It's going good. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, obviously um, getting back to a normal summer here last year with COVID. We obviously started super late and, kind of forget how fast summer flies by when you only have a couple of months. So definitely getting back to the nitty gritty, kind of excited to get back into, uh, you know, a training camp and and whatnot, Um, but still trying to kind of enjoy the last little bit of summer here. This weekend was a good one, kind of had a little date night on Friday night. Uh, With the old old lady? Yeah, yeah. I was throwing around ideas to all the boys in the locker room and I was getting a, (laughs) I was, I was, I was getting a lot of crazy suggestions, but we ended up uh going to that seven story brewing company is that what it's called in pittsburgh there yeah, yeah it was it was really good vibes grabbed a drink watch or listen to a little music and then we went to that uh next door by wegman's you guys been to that oh, place great it was really yeah. good her mom had been raving about it for a while so we uh we had to finally go check it out and it uh exceeded expectate great vibes in there too which and is what does all wegman's, about vibes what does wegman's not crush like so what's true, what, dude. Yeah. What's his wagon's not it. too perfect? Honestly, we're, totally we're pretty lucky it. that we have it. People, people come into town for like seminars, like strength coaches from out of town are like, we're going to Wegmans. Just let's go. That's where we're going <laughs> the whole time we're here. Dude, we're right. It is honestly the absolute best. And I feel like you don't realize it until you go back to a normal grocery store and you're just like, this stinks. Yeah, it really does. Dude, that's how I felt when I used to live in like Cedar Rapids and juniors. Like you're walking in these grocery stores and they just, it's like a, mini walmart they're just brutal when you go exactly. there and you get away from wagmans hey did you guys split the bill when you went to dinner <laughs> absolutely no absolutely, absolutely not no no i, had, I, I took her out to that one i i owed her one um i owed her one for sure but then then saturday I went to uh my buddy shane stickle's wedding out in Cuca. Awesome wedding. Congrats to those two um, on their big day. And it was actually hilarious. Uh, my buddy there, Shane, gave it, he basically gave himself his own best man speech. I think he I think he was going out. He was so wasted. It was so funny. But I think he was planned on going up there to, you know, thank everyone for coming out and whatnot. But he just totally went off, off script and uh out it was it was electric so that was my weekend in a nutshell uh was, that was a great capper to it for sure but uh nader was on vacation i'm excited to hear about uh yeah florida. Was the trip to florida with the fam yeah it was so last minute we had a we had a credit from before covid and um it got rescheduled twice it was supposed to be my entire family my extended family and then they let us know that it's it's it would like expire next week <clears throat> and like you're just out of luck so you know, you got condo, you got flight that's just going to go away. So uh, my wife and the girls were like, all right, let's just go. So we went just for four days down to Florida, pick the spot, just us and the girls. And, you know, when we go on vacation, it's usually us and like the cousins and stuff. And right. But to just hang with just the girls was pretty sick. And uh, there was that tropical storm coming up. So we were kind of watching that, but it kept pushing off and it, it missed us. So we had awesome weather and uh, it was awesome, man. How, yeah. how hard is it to travel, like go on vacation with, with kids? I know your kids are a little bit older yeah, now, but like, all- I just think about if, if I went on vacation with myself as a young kid, I would not want to go on vacation. <laughs> no, they're, they're 11 and nine and like they're, yeah. they're older now. Like when they were little, it was, it was a grind. And like, there were a couple of times on the plane where they'd be like, Oh, that baby's crying. I'm like, yeah, you have no <laughs> idea what it's like to fly with a baby. And like, you were that kid. Yeah. So zip it and. Exactly. I, I always feel so bad for those parents because there's nothing you can do, and you always Dude, have nothing. the the typical uh, 
excuse my French assholes yeah. on the plane yeah, yeah. who are like, Oh my God. It's like, dude, the kid's a baby. What do you expect it to do? It's never experienced yeah. this. What is the proper protocol on that? Like what's the polite thing to do? Do you, you put, do? put your headphones you in and go to yeah. sleep? Yeah. Like, no, the kid like, I'm saying though, do you pick him up and like, dude, yeah, you, try you, get the st- you try to get the kid to stop crying. Like, what are you going to do? Like, I can't stand uppity people that get upset yeah. with yeah. kids crying on That's- a plane. Like, Figure it out. To put your like with their in. their ears popping too. Like the baby's never experienced their ears popping. Yeah, man. Like it's what's going on? on an, it's right. a baby thirty thousand feet in the air. Like <laughs> it can find to a space. <laughs> like yeah. exactly. relax. I but it was good. Boys, it was good spe- to get away. Speaking of babies, uh, my wife had the baby shower this weekend, so my house is an absolute war zone with gifts That's and boxes, great. and I was setting up uh, pack and plays. I had a laner over the other yeah, night. He's helping me, me set that. up a bunch of gifts and whatnot, but this place is an absolute. What's the actual date on that? Do you have, is there like date? the due date? Yeah. Yeah. October 29th. Sorry on that, on your child. <laughs> <laughs> on the birth of my child. Yeah. End of October. October 29th. Man, that's exciting. Dude. That, and I'm sure it went well. I, I want to hear about your entry into the baby shark. Cause that's a thing, right? Huh. Like at the end, you got to walk in like the man and like, so here, that's not to thing. bore everybody. Yeah, that's dude, it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's absurd. So me, me, Laner, and a few of the boys, we went and grabbed lunch because all the girls are obviously at the shower. Well, I thought, you know, the showers last like two hours. So we go get lunch and now we're done at like three. And my wife texts me, she's like, come at like five, five fifteen. So I'm like, I planned this out so I could come straight there. So then we're sitting there like, what are we going to do? So we drive to Henrietta and we went go-karting at the indoor go-karting place <laughs> in Henrietta. Oh, those dude, that's fun. Dude, those things are wild. Like they whip t- torque on your hands, man, as you're going, like in your arms. But anyways, I had texted my mom at like three. I was like, "Hey, do I bring flowers? To this, like, what do you do? Because like you know, wedding shower, you bring the flowers. Like, ah, oh, yada yada. I'm the husband to be." She texts me back at four fifty, like, and I'm supposed to be there in twenty minutes. I was like, "Yeah, she should bring flowers." I said, "Well, thanks for the, thanks for the notice on that." So I f- me- now I'm flying to Wagmans. I run in, I grab two dozen roses, and then. Dude, nobody cared about the flowers. I walked in. I was like, I didn't even exist when I walked in there, dude. <laughs> That's so I walk in the door with the flowers. I wore a pink shirt because we're having a girl. Like thinking, like, oh uh, I had a, I had a hat made that said "Girl Dad" on it. I'm thinking, like, all dude. the girls would be like, oh my god. And I walk in, and nobody. They were just like, hey, the presents are in the front. Can you just load your truck up? And I was like, hey, you get wow. to see everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you you went. All out for yeah. the outfit too. I was gonna ask like, what'd you wear? Because that's a thing. Like, I, am I? Yeah. yeah. You went all. Yeah. Out. I, so I had no the hat. I had the hat made, made that day. Yeah, but there it was go. just a. Uh, I you know take, it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Play. I got it right here. I got my pen. <laughs> it is what it is. I should have not listened to my mom because my wife doesn't even like flowers. But all right, enough enough of the uh, boring stuff. So we're here, episode two. Um, so the podcast premise, obviously, for those who listened to episode one and kind of got the idea. What we want to focus on going forward is the 1%, you know, the things that high performing athletes, high performing people do on a day to day basis to gain a competitive advantage. Um, So that's the basis of the podcast. It could be a multiple, multiple different things that you can do in order for that to be a 1% in your case. Um, But we kind of wanted this episode to really be about the other 99%, like the things you have to do in order to be able to even do the 1%. You can't jump to that. So I want to send this to Nader here. Just kind of go over his talk and his thought process on the 99% and uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah. So really this could be its own podcast in itself. And uh, the whole purpose of us wanting to kind of chat about this a little bit, this episode before getting into these very detailed one percentile advantages and edges is that a lot of times people skip right to the one percent so you know they look for the magic pill and that's just kind of our culture in a sense at times where if you look at all of these countless um you know fad diets and fad exercise programs that have come and gone it's because people are jumping for the magic pill so what can i do in the least amount of time to reach my goals and the real the real answer is there's nothing like it has to be a a comprehensive approach to whatever your goals are whether you're an athlete or a a person just trying to be healthier um you know it's it's got to be a comprehensive approach and it has to be consistent you know the whole saying you know, wellness or health is not a destination. It's a journey. And that's true. Like you don't get there and you're done. It's something you have to consistently be working on. So I think the biggest thing for us to kind of get through to people is all these 1% edges that we're going to be talking about. That's the icing on the cake. Like you, 
you don't put shingles on until you build the house. And I think you have to build the foundation of performance, of wellness, before you start looking for the bells and the whistles that we're going to be talking about. So I think that's just important to kind of get across. And, you know, we have several examples and I don't want to be sitting here rambling the entire time. So feel free to jump in at any point, but, you know, looking at a guy like Cole, who I've worked with for a few years now here in his pro career, he's got the foundation, right? And we talked a little bit about like, it's it's not just hard work. You know, and hard work is important. And that's part of the recipe. Like it's hard work to consistently eat well, get enough sleep, you know, train consistently. That's hard work. But hard work is not the only thing. And Cole and I had a good conversation recently about like, you know, talent and hard work and all those things. Like hard work is not always going to beat out talent. You know, you could be the hardest worker in the world and, you know, there could be someone that's more talented than you to the point where even if they're not working as hard as you, they're going to be more successful and reach those goals quicker than you. But hard work has to be part of the recipe to get to the 1%. So Cole, I don't know if you want to jump on Absolutely. that. Before I yeah. I kind of want to backtrack a little bit there. I didn't want to, I didn't want to cut you off, but the biggest thing when you're talking about the magic pill, um, you know, kind of the cheat to get to the end goal. Um, <clears throat> you know, I do think that there's some people who are just, you know, trying to get to the end goal, looking, like I said, not to backtrack, but looking for the cheat. But also, um, I know we were going to save this for a different podcast, but man, this is why I absolutely hate social media. It gets me so rattled because like this is (laughs) just just one point, man, is that like there's, like you said, there's so many fad diets, so many, so many ads for different nutritional things, um, so many different workouts going there that it is, it is kind of hard to stick to your roots and keep going. Um, you know, just off the top of, I mean, it sucks me in all the time too. And I don't even have social media, for instance, have you guys seen that, that YouTube guy? Um, I'm a big YouTuber, but <laughs> that YouTube, that YouTube guy who is like, don't eat the salad, eat the pizza. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, dude, he comes, up on, he comes up on an ad all the time. Yeah. All the time, dude. And even though I know it's absolute, like, bullshit, I still, I still get sucked in. And next thing I know, I'm spending 20 minutes to figure out what four <laughs> foods are killing my testosterone. You know, it's like, it's like, how does, how does this, how does this happen? It's just, I mean it's incredible of, of all the stuff out there and how it can just absolutely take hold of you. And again, I, like, I do want to dive into social media a little bit more, but I think it's just so true. So important to kind of stay true to yourself. And, and like Nader said, when it comes to, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily just working hard. And that's something I, I wanted to make, you know, pretty clear here because that can be a cliche. It's, you know, it's all about getting better and figuring out what you need to do, um, in your specific situation to kind of reach the goals that you want. And obviously, you know, working hard is a, is a foundation that needs to be there. But at the end of the day, you got to have, you know, the self exploration to kind of figure out what you need individually, and then being able to, you know, stay true and, and stay consistent to focusing on, you know, your weaknesses. For me, that's a, exactly what the 99% is. Um, and again, that's, that's something that uh, is huge moving forward. So getting into a little bit more specific, you know, the magic pill, there's no such thing. And, you know, we have people come to us all the time asking us what, for an example, and there's a bunch of them, but like what supplement should I take, you know, and, and what, what brand and what type of supplement. And it's like, well, let's, let's back up. Like what's, what'd you eat today? You're like, well, I, I didn't have breakfast. And then, you know, after the lift, I, I ran to, you know, Wendy's real quick. And then I, you know, I'm going to have, I had 17 beers last night and it's like, <laughs> let's, let's back way up. Okay. So yeah. let's focus on everything else before you worry about the supplement. Like there's no supplement that's just going to, you're going to take and you're going to be better. You have to focus on building the house before you put the shingles on. So that's one example. And when it comes to nutrition, like, do you have a protein on your plate? Do you have a vegetable on your plate? Do you have a a carb on your plate? You know, are the foods on your plate natural or, you know what I mean? So like people worrying about the the magic pill supplement before taking 15 minutes to prepare their breakfast and lunch for the next day is absurd, but it happens 
way more than you would think. And again, that's why a lot of these people yeah. are in business. I was I was just going to ask that. People. Like, what do you how how often do you think people are just absolutely cheating on their meals? Like it's, even like at like any anyone that that I guess is concerned about it. Like how often if they say they are actually into it. But how often are they actually kind of like going outside their lane and and picking up the Wendy's or picking up a quick brekkie sandwich? Because yeah, I, which which a couple of things on that. So first of all, and this goes with the the entire ninety nine percent. So the house that we're trying to build here, perfection is not necessary and it's not realistic, and it's probably not even healthy mentally to be one hundred percent perfect. That's what I was. You know what I'm say. saying? Yeah. So I think yeah, that's sure. that's important. Like. Perfection is not required to meet your goals and build the house before you get to one of the 1%, but consistency is. So yeah. we say most of the time, right? So like if you're having natural whole foods, solid, well-balanced meals, most of the time, and then you go for a, a breakfast sandwich or a pizza or whatever the case may be, you're fine. You know what I mean? But sometimes when people think that perfection is mandatory, that even mentally can get them all rattled and, and kick them off of their path. So I think that the focus on all this 99% stuff needs to be consistency, not perfection. Then we talk about the 80, 20, 90, 10, 95, five rule, where like based on your goals, you know, like me as a, as a middle-aged dad, like 80, 20 is probably pretty good for me, where if I can eat well, you know, and, and stick to my lifestyle, you know, rules 80% of the time. And I, I do some other things 20% of the time. I'm in a really good place. Cole is a current pro athlete. You should probably be closer to 90, 10, 95, five. You know what I mean? For and, sure. And, it, and even if, if you take a, a guy in your shoes, Cole, who has some significant, let's say body composition goals where they need to lean out before camp, whatever the case is, they should be 95, five. But a hundred zero is not is not really even healthy. You know what I yeah, mean? Man. Yeah. That that mental the mental aspect of kind of chasing the perfection, except especially when it comes to diet is is so hard, man. That's drained on me. That's something that I've kind of backed off a little bit with, and it's it's helped me so much. Like, man, I went through a stage where I wouldn't even this is kind of partly on my laziness too, but I wouldn't even I wouldn't even cook my vegetables. It was just like straight two vegetables eat the broccoli right, right from the crown piece of meat every single day, seven days a week. And man, like you said, the mental drain of that is so crazy. Now I'm a, I don't know if we've talked about that, but every Saturday it pizza, pepper, large pepperoni pizza, go to town as much as I can handle. And that, I, <laughs> <laughs> and there's usually not much left from that, but it does, it does help a lot to kind of build in, um, you know, a little window for yourself. And that does play a huge role on the psyche. For I, sure. and I even, Mike, you, sorry, Nader, yeah. I was gonna say, I, was I even say. think it goes to the, the person too. And what, what you find works for you. And I think Nader was the person who helped me find that. Um, Nader came in my, did you come in junior year Nader at RIT? I think so. my junior year. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. midway through junior year. Um, and I was hurt junior year. I had sprained my ankle. So I'm on the shelf. I put on a few pounds and Nader really helped me get back on track. And my first game back wasn't until the postseason. Um, and then after that season ended, we won the Atlanta hockey and whatnot. I really sat down with Nader and was like, listen, I need to lose weight this off season. I really need to get after it. And I, re I will say that was like the most disciplined I'd probably ever been in my entire playing career. As far as listening to everything that Nate told me, as far as diet, you know, have your proteins here, have this, you know, make your eggs in the morning and have your one cheat meal, whether it's on Sunday, but keep your cheat meal to be like relatively healthy. And I would go to like Panera and get like a turkey avocado sandwich, which obviously is eight, 900 calories. But, and I ended up losing that summer. Do you remember, Nate? I lost 37 pounds in like, Dang. I want to say like just under two months. Like it was crazy because we were crushing workouts in the morning and I was just listening to everything. And the discipline is the biggest thing. I'd say discipline as far as the 99% might be the biggest thing to and whether it's your rest, recovery, your diet, all that stuff. I think discipline is the biggest factor in all of that. Yeah. You, you got to yeah. build the right habits too, man. Like habits, I, Ronnie rolls my coach in, uh, in Ann Arbor there would always say habits are your destiny. And it's, it's like such a true quote, man. Like you really just, whatever you continue to do is that's, that's what, 
it's going to be easy to do. So you really got to go out of your way to string, like you said, have some discipline and string together a couple, uh, like a time frame of what you're looking to do. And then eventually that just becomes habit and it takes over. It comes easier and easier. And looking back at your situation, Mike, so you're a guy, you know, your body type might be a little bit tougher to lean out than others. And it's just, this is how it yeah, is. And it is what it is. Um, but you had some significant goals and I know our coaching staff did for you as well. And, you know, you put the time in and you, you know, made the progress and you earned all of that. But if you think back to what we talked about, I was not, we weren't counting calories. We weren't, no, we weren't macros. We weren't, um, you know, there was no magic supplements there. It was like, Mike, let's go three whole food meals a day. This is what your plate should look like. Stay away from the extracurriculars as much as possible. Get sleep, yeah. train hard. Let's see how that goes. You know what and I mean? I, like, well, the biggest thing was too. Like, I remember you saying, like, cut out sugars except natural sugars and fruit, but don't eat a lot of fruit because of how high the sugar content is. You know, let's cut out dairy except for only the Greek yogurt, which was like plain non-fat Greek yogurt, no flavoring in it. Let's cut out a lot of the grains, maybe one portion of rice a week with a meal here and there if you want to do that. And that kind of changed my whole mindset of, and I remember you saying like the food doesn't like season it, put some olive oil on the pan, put a little salt, put a little pepper. It doesn't have to be people. I feel like I always think like, Oh, I got to drink my kale smoothie this morning or something like you can eat good and right. clean and still enjoy every meal while eating extremely healthy. Yeah. And the nutritionists out there listening to us are going to put me on a steak if I don't clear that up. But yeah, you're, you're a carb a week <laughs> is aggressive, but you know, huh? Cutting a, a no, carb a week is it was like clean. Yeah. It was like clean greens and stuff like that. Right. No, but but being aware of what your plate should look like is what we did, and you definitely yeah. carbs on your plate every day. But yeah, again, and the, and then I personally, and we'll have a whole nutrition um, episode with an actual nutritionist. I'm not a nutritionist. It's just something that is again. I you're, you're very smart though with it. But with that all said you know, we try not to say, cut this, cut this, cut this. It's do this, do this, do this, and try to give the tools. But at the same time, that usually equates to, dude, you guys would be amazed with like, I need, you know, I need to cut out this much body composition. I'll be like, all right, what's your, what do you have in your coffee every day? And exactly. Like, well, three yeah. creams and three sugars, like, well, there it is. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah let's, sure. let's change this and just do everything else like you normally do. And <laughs> so anyway, a lot of things are hidden in that sense. But nutrition is a huge part of that when it comes to 99 percent, such a low hanging fruit, such an important part of building the foundation that the one percent can stand on. Um, other things we talk about, the other 23 or the other 22 or whatever that might be. So like, you know, people train or practice or whatever it is so hard. And they think, okay, I'm good. And then they kind of go on and do whatever, do whatever it is they want. And like, that's one or two hours of your day. Like there are 22 other hours, the other 22. So what are you doing there? And nutrition's a big part that we talked about. We've talked a little bit about it in the first episode, how insanely important sleep is. And it's not just so you feel good, but there is like, there are hormonal responses going on in your body when you're sleeping well in a certain amount that directly correlate to your recovery and your performance and all of these different things. And um, that's another huge low hanging fruit that we'll do another episode on as well. We'll get some experts on to talk about some of those things, but you know, we, we talk often about sleep hygiene where, you know, what, what are some things for me, not just to sleep well or to sleep for a longer period of time, but to sleep well. And, you know, people oftentimes will complain about, you know, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I'm trying to get my eight hours. I just can't sleep. It's like, so what are you doing? What's your routine before bed? And they'll be like, I don't know. I, I'm on my phone. I fall asleep with the TV on. The phone's, like, the the phone's brutal for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So Cole, Cole, go off on, a, go off on yeah. some tangents there, buddy. Well, I'm a huge sleep guy. I've always, I've always slept really well. So I, I can't, um, you know, I know some people struggle with it more, but I was actually talking to Mike about this and I was thinking that this needs to be uh, Mike's challenge for the week because that's that's one of the areas that he said he's kind of struggled. Um, obviously, he's got a lot going on with the kid coming up, but honestly, the biggest thing that I've ever done with sleep that has, that has worked like a charm and it's incredible is um, every night, and I forgot who told me to do this, but every night um, 
not every night, but usually I'll try to plug my phone in at 8.30 in like a separate room and just not not touch it for the rest of the night. And then I still continue. I, I do sleep with the TV on and whatnot, watch TV up until bed, but I don't touch my phone for the hour before I go to bed. Man, and it is the second my head hits the pillow, I'm out. It's it's the weirdest thing. And then if forever, whatever reason, you know, I'm trying to get guys for a skate the next day, staying up or staying up a little bit later with my phone out, I, I struggle to sleep. So that's uh, – I think we might have to make that as your challenge because yeah, dude, but, it, it works, man. How is he going to organize the next podcast, though? Exactly. Right, like, <laughs> he's on it. Dude, but that's the thing, and you can make so many excuses like what if this person calls, what if this person yeah. calls. And, and that's another thing, like kind of this 99% is like you can make those excuses or you can just – you know, hammer it out, have a little discipline and try it. Like if anyone, if there's an emergency, they're going to call your wife. If your wife has your phone, you know, like people are going to, going to get a hold of you. Actually, before oh, I yeah. jump in, I should, I should hear what you were going to, going to say why it's not possible. <laughs> no, no, it is possible. <laughs> 830 for me is not possible. I'm going to say well, what time, right what now. time do you, what time do you go to get yourself in the wrapper? Well, this is like a whole nother <laughs> probably like podcast. And I, I honestly like all joking aside, like I get really bad, like nighttime anxiety. So like sleeping for me in general is tough. Most nights, like I've been taking this, uh, this supplement from this company called like Bulletproof. And it's like, uh, it's like a sleep aid gummy and it's got like a low dosage of melatonin and then GABA in it, which I believe I'm not an expert, but from what I've read on this is like, your body naturally creates that to keep you asleep. But anyways, that's besides Dude, melatonin that's what, in general will give sounds me. like a magic pill to me. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but no, I mean, Hey, melatonin but like, no, my the freaks, but do like my anxiety is like a real thing at night. Like it's, it's, it's very, very heavy at nighttime. And like, for instance, last night I get these random like spells, like maybe once every like two, three weeks where my body physically won't let me go to sleep. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Like I'll doze off and then I get jolted like back awake by my body. So, and the phone, obviously, yeah. I, and I do put my phone away, but now to circle back, I mean, I work until seven every day. So like by the time I get home, eat dinner, and then I shower, like I'm on the couch at like eight, eight thirty to to settle down. So like I like to have it for like at least an hour or so. You know, I gotta I gotta follow along the Yankees game on on Twitter and whatnot and, and go from there. But no, I do agree and I have been trying to do that more where I plug it in and I leave it face down. And when I'm ready to go, I just don't even look at you put it. In a, you put it in a separate room. That's a big one too. Don't put it where you're sleeping. Well, I don't have an Uller to wake me up in the morning. So I need it somewhere near me for an alarm clock so I could get you up in the put morning. Put it in the hallway. But that's what it comes But that's the thing is like, realistically, you probably like if, how bad is the sleep messing with you right now? Because if it's messing with you pretty big, it's, you gotta, you gotta try it. No, I know. I, Hey, all right, that's my one percent. But eight thirty is not my time, though. I think maybe like what, what time you get in the wrapper? That's what I said. Let's get let's get it an hour before plugged into a separate room. You can hear it going what? off in a different room. This is, this is another tough one because my wrapper the last two weeks, well, actually the last month has been my couch in the back family room because my wife, uh, like with her belly getting bigger, she can't get comfortable in bed. So she's been sleeping on the couch. So I feel bad, and we have a big sectional, so I sleep on it with her. So it's kind of like I watch the game on guy. the couch, and then I like go to bed on the couch also after because I don't want to leave her back here in the back room by herself. So I'm in the wrapper realistically like eight o'clock, but I'm really not just settling put, into just, bed. Just put just put your just put your phone away, but like an hour before you go to bed. All right, deal. Put, uh, put that's, it in a different my, room. Set your alarm. Don't look at it. Uh, I want to hear the results next week. So that's my one so back up as well. We'll 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 make that official by the end. But <laughs> let's let's back up a second. So as far as like taking the supplements to sleep, like not saying that's a bad thing, but we're definitely gonna do it our own sleep episode. And you know, I would be very interested to to know like what breathing techniques would do for you before before sleep and yeah you know, anxiety and depression will have an episode about that as well and those are things that need to be taken seriously and you know not saying that that's you're going to do some breathing techniques and that's going to be cured but i think before you would even start looking into supplements that would help you there are several other techniques that could potentially improve the the quality and the the ability to get to sleep like breathing techniques like screen time um, like, you know, mindfulness and meditation, all of those different things are out there, you know, yeah. in, environment when people sleeping, like what's the temperature in your room and we're like, yeah, it, you should be mid sixties. What's, what's going on from a sound standpoint, like people have done really well with white noises and things like that. So definitely not, need that. 
it's not saying that if if it's a if it's a specific need that a potential sleep supplement as long as it's natural could be beneficial if if your doctor is okay with it but at the end of the day there are probably several things to focus on before that and i think that's really to be honest the whole point of this episode so you know we definitely will dive in more to that when we um when we get to the the sleep the sleep uh, episode. Um, and another thing I, I think a big part of the 99% could be as well is way deeper than this and probably makes yeah way more sense is, is your why. And, you know, we talk about this often with all of our athletes and, you know, I had a great meeting with um, David Salako last night, the other, uh, one of the RIT assistants about motivation with our team. Associate head coach, David Salako. Yes, exactly. Thank you for clearing that up. But um, <laughs> what's, how do you get people to truly be motivated? And, you know, you can be like, oh, well, you know, this, we have to add a, a banner to the rafters or we have to create, you know, score all these points so I can sign a deal, whatever. But like, is that really the most motivating factor in someone's life that 1000% not like you need to tap into emotions like way deeper than those things. So like, what is your personal why? Like Cole, why are you taking so much time and effort to be your very best and get back up to the show? Like what's your why? You don't need to necessarily answer me right now, unless you wanted to, to dive in, but yeah. And, and just to jump in there and like, especially from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I talked about it in the first episode, but after a couple of years um, pro, I kind of hit this wall of d- development and my growth was going nowhere. And I do think a big reason is because I lost track of my why. Um, I just, I started, you know, freaking out about getting to the NHL, thinking that all I was, was this hockey player. I started, you know, basically thinking to myself that, you know, I was going to lose worth to people if I couldn't get to the NHL my whole life. I kind of been a hockey, been known as the hockey player, just like a lot of kids that play the sport when they're younger. And, um, you know, it started to weigh on me and that wasn't why I originally started playing hockey. You know, I, I just love the game. I love being in the love, love, the loud guy in the locker room. I love hanging out with the, with the boys. And at the end of the day, I just love getting better too. Like I love trying to, I love practicing and I love, you know, adding new tools to my kit. And that's kind of where this, um, 1% actually came from there is that's kind of accelerated my growth more than anything else. Just kind of my rejuvenating my, my love for, for practicing and in honing my skill skills and whatnot. Um, and again, I kind of said it earlier, but I think that is, that is the true 99%. Like Nate said, is being able to have this self exploration, kind of see where you're at, ask yourself why you're doing it. And then once you kind of figure out your why, figuring out what you need to, to keep going and, and keep that energy up. Um, and again, that's that's something that I kind of, the psychological part of it, I'd love to dive deeper into in a later episode, but that's kind of um, the, the framework where, where I'm coming from. And I, I think a big thing that people miss too is like, yeah, you can talk about what I want to get out of this, what I'm trying to accomplish, what I'm trying to be, blah, blah, blah. But one thing that I think has turned a corner for, I think myself personally, and a lot of the people that I've worked with is how are you impacting other people? And I think Dude, like, I stole. that's a really big question people need to ask more. I read a really good book by Tony Dungy, the, you know, famous football coach called soul of a team. And I'm not sure Cole, have you read it? I got it. I'm about, I am 20 something pages in, but I right. uh, switched over to the, to that uh, mushroom book. so anyway the this is it's like a parable and it's basically a bunch of tony dungy's experiences a coach put into this fictional story but soul stands for selflessness ownership unity and larger purposes and it was pretty powerful and it's like all right larger purpose what's your largest what's the larger purpose man like who are you impacting by being a pro hockey player like think about all the little kids that go to your games and you're, you know, you're impacting them. Think about your, you know, all those different things um, that Mike and I do on a day to day that potentially impact other people. And I don't think, I don't think people think about that enough. No, absolutely not. And it's, and again, going back to social media, I think that that kind of sucks you down a rabbit hole too. Of you, you see everyone else kind of posting these 
the ideal lifestyles and it's and it is it's kind of brings you off the tracks a little bit but like you said at the end of the day um you got to think bigger picture for sure i i think too it sounds so cliche i'm glad that you touched on that with tony dungy um i always had a fear when i played of letting my teammates down too like i didn't want to be the guy to blow a game or to not try and practice and maybe throw off the flow of practice or you know it was always that fear of letting myself down and letting my teammates down most importantly was like my biggest why and why I did a lot of of the certain things I did in college and why I played I feel like with a certain tenacity I feel like I was the most fiery guy on the ice but I did that because I truly care and I truly wanted what was best for me and my teammates exactly yeah I, I, I wonder how much of that is is a goalie thing too and and being like the last line of defense there, you know, yeah, I, could it could be be. I couldn't imagine how stressful that would be. Nah, you just yeah. rock and roll, baby. I didn't you just, you just <laughs> get out there, baby. You fucking rock and roll. I was, the, so, I was, I would say I was the, like, I'm the off brand. Cause like you could talk to me in the locker room in between periods. Like I could shoot the shit in between the second and third. But when I put my mask on and walked on the ice and I was just tunnel vision, like it was time to go. Yeah. Um, oh, and then I, 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 oh, the weirdest, and I can't wait. Whoa, for, like, whoa, whoa. they honestly, I, some of my best friends in the world, Mikey being one of them, are goalies, and like a lot of like some of my best friends in Lehigh were goalies too. But they all are quirky, man. Just, just they're all weird. No one's normal. But Mike, I'm just a, Mike, you I'm are just, you are one of the most normal goalies. Though. I will totally yeah, get I'm just a, and I, I'm just a I guy wait. from Greece, New York, baby. Eat the I West can't High. wait till our uh, our interview with Jared DeMichael later. It's I, you guys going to start some, talking some weird oh. language. I don't and no that's going to understand. Goalie and actually, talk. this is the first time. Uh, so for those listening right now, um, a little bit later on in this episode, we have on Jared DeMichael, who is a former RIT legend and the associate head coach of UMass Amherst uh, Division One hockey team in hockey. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, we're really excited to have him on the podcast yeah. today, and uh, we can't wait to get to that interview. And I think one more thing to touch on before we, we get out of the 99%, the house that, that needs to be built before the shingles get on. The last brick for me, and it should probably be the biggest thing, is is just overall awareness, man. And I, you know, uh, Cole and I have talked about this a, a bit. We have uh, the guru of of uh, this stuff right in our backyard, Kurt Bednarsik, who's one of my best friends. Oh, I can't friends. wait and, to get him on here. Oh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great episode. But anyway, he, he put on a leadership course last year called center out leadership group. And it was um, everything from college coaches, strength coaches, college athletes, just people that wanted to improve their leadership. And, you know, I did it because he was my friend and I believe in, in a lot of the things he does, but I got so much out of it. And I think the biggest overarching thing is like, awareness like walking through the airport and trust me i'm i'm not always innocent of this even my kids like at times can get sucked in but the number of people that are just zoned out in their phone or whatever it might be this is it could be another separate topic as well but just not aware of what's going on like huh. think about all the stuff you're missing and if you really want to like reach your full potential and your full performance, but you're completely missing most of the things that are going on around you and within yourself, like think about how many, you know, opportunities you're going to miss, whether it's to get better, whether it's to succeed. And, you know, the biggest thing Kurt always says, and, and I, I've done a lot of reading in this as well, is like, look, listen, feel, respond, like get your head up, look, listen, figure out what's going on around you feel appropriately and then respond appropriately. And like talking a lot about like gratitude and all these things like the get, you know, the have to versus the get to. And like, we, we get to do the things we do on a daily basis. Like that's a privilege. Like we should be grateful for that. You should, if you walk into life being like, Oh man, I got to go coach my pro hockey group at seven 15 in the morning versus like, right. I can't believe I get to work with these guys. I'm what a privilege. You know what I mean? Like that's a yeah, whole sure. different narrative that impacts your attitude, impacts how you impact other people. Um, and it, and ultimately impacts your success and, and where you can go. So I, I think that's something I wanted to definitely touch on as well. How important that is. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And uh, not even the, the phone. Go ahead, Mikey, you go. No, 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 no. Go, go, go. In first. Well, no. I was just going to say like, 
the phone thing is definitely wild, especially nowadays with like people are just so glued. We will go out to dinner on the road and you'll look over and four guys aren't even having a conversation with each other. They're just all on their phones. Um, for me, I'm not big uh, phone guy, but I struggle with just the, you know, they call it the monkey brain or the voice inside your head, man. My voice is just always, always going. And, and it's led to like some pretty severe anxiety to me. But that's another thing is when I'm just listening to, to the voice inside my head, I'm not, I'm not present. Like you said, and being aware is so huge. Um, I think when you're doing those, I forgot exactly what you said, but basically kind of like the five senses there of, of feeling, listening, hearing, not t- he didn't say taste for sure, but <laughs> <laughs> listening but, and hearing are different too. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, oh, true, true. <laughs> yeah, true. It's what, what, it feel, feel, feel was another yeah, one there too. Yeah. But long story short, when you're kind of you know doing those sensory things, it, it is the only time when you're at this another episode too, but kind of at peace and you don't have any clutter going on in your head, and you can actually just be in the moment and and enjoy what you're doing. And I think um, another thing like that, you know. The common, the common saying there, and enjoy the journey, not the destination, is is such a big thing, um, and that's something that uh, you know really hit home for me when I when I finally got my first game in the NHL and, and kind of looked back and just be like, dude, I that was like I'm glad I'm here, but that was a grind, man. Like that was that that wasn't uh, I wasn't enjoying the setbacks and the the little things in life and. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm happy to be where I am, but I kind of do wish that I can turn the clock around a little bit and just simply enjoy those four years leading up to it and not feel such a grind from it. So, um, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent there, but I think that that is super important as well. Yeah, I do too. Um, Before we wrap this up, boys, uh, we talk about, we want to finish each episode on our portion. We're going to get to the interview in a couple minutes here, but we like to do this thing we call is uh, Cole's Quirks where we talk about something that Cole does that maybe other people don't do. And this week, I can't wait. Dude, this is Nader. Wait till you hear this. No, honestly, so, I Nate, didn't think this was this weird until you. Hold on, you, hold on. Can you mute Cole there? Hold on, hold <laughs> on, Cole. Zip it. So I get a call at work yesterday. I'm about to finish up work. And Cole calls me. And this is our conversation. He goes, hey, I just thought of this. Is it weird that I only wash my hair once every two to three weeks? <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude honest, honestly, I feel I, like there's more people out there that 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 don't dude, do it. You're not supposed to wash it all the time. Yeah, right. But two to three weeks is a crazy dude. This guy, now go on, go. I'll tell you. He went off on like his reasonings. Like I just feel like my hair is staticky when I wash it all the yeah, time. Yeah, so that's I just, when I was <laughs> when I was younger, man. I would wash in condition every single day, and my hair was so frizzy, like toothpicky would stay up in the air, not toothpicky, um, cotton swabby where it's just poofy up. Um, and I hated it. And then I forgot who I was playing with. And someone's like, dude, you just, you just don't wash it that much. You're not supposed to like, you're not supposed to wash it that much. And I stopped doing it and I got a little natural grease in there and I love it. <laughs> dude, but he's, he's telling me this and I'm like, yes, that is true. Like my wife's like a professional hairstylist. Yeah, we need to go to what she does. Google that. But like, it's like every, like they say you should wash it like every two to three days. Realistically, I wash my hair every time in the shower, but I also like, I have the shortest hair. I keep my hair short. Cause like I don't shampoo like and conditioner you're saying, or just I've never, shampoo. I don't, I don't condition cause my hair is not long enough to condition. Yeah. Like I don't, I, I got to finish I, it off with a, with a conditioner. I, I think we've actually might've talked about this before call. And I, I'm rattled because you know, you've, you've got some good hair, bro. Like maybe I yeah. need to do a little bit less washing exactly you know, see but thank you you know what you know what <laughs> freaks me out is when guys don't wear a hat on the golf course it like it, it drives it, not that i'm it, one of those like, guys you, cole you doesn't are, wear a hat that's where, yeah that's where i was going because if i went with no hat and i like had to put stuff in my hair like it all get slimy down my face if i didn't put stuff in my hair i'd look like you know bill murray from that uh the bowling movie was <laughs> the kingpin there uh, it's where it's like, his comb over yeah 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 but, <laughs> But you're a guy that can go golfing with no bucket, and you know what? No it product. Stays there. No product. No it's just, product. It's just grease. Either. Just straight Maybe grease. Maybe this is something like, I got to look into. The only that, and that's the thing too, is that before when I'd wash my hair every day when I was younger, I'd have to put product in there to keep it keep it down and keep it under control. And now it's the only time I'll use product if it's like I'm on an all day thing, like a wedding. This past weekend on the wedding, if you see some pics, I had product in. But other than that, no product. 
My hair gets can crazy we, after the golf course. Can we though. agree though that uh, bad smelling hair is one of the worst smells on the planet? Like, yeah, does, and, and, does yeah. your or does your Mrs. Ever say exactly? Anything about that? That's what I was gonna say. I mean, I've had a time where she's like, "Hey, she hates it too." But I've had, <laughs> I've had times where, she, where, but that's, but the thing is, is that she hates it. But then when I wash my hair, I get that frizzy look, and she's like, "You look like an idiot too." So I'm like, "How do I, how do I win this battle?" <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's no maybe, happy medium maybe there. The trillion lines of product that they put out there. I don't know. Do you know they make stuff like dry shampoo too, so like you don't have to necessarily like wash in the yeah, shower? Yeah, never, never mess with that. Maybe I'll give my give that. my wife a call. She's a professional in that. Field. Yeah, she, she could yeah. take you down your hair your hair path but dude i just i had to bring it up nader for this episode because when like he it, called me yesterday i told him i was like dude we're don't even mention this because he wanted to mention this randomly i was like i'm gonna save this for cole's quirks at the end because i i can't fail well, just i wanted to just ask i wanted to ask i wanted that's why i want to know it'd be i wish I there was a play a, a spot I look for forward listeners. To seeing some of the uh like social media yeah so i look forward yeah. to seeing i want to know i want to know if anyone else does that because yeah. i swear i've played with like a good amount of guys who I'm like, yeah, man, I don't wash my hair either. And that makes what, me feel a little bit better. Can I ask I what you're going it. on? What are you going on right now? Like, how long has it been? Dude, <laughs> over two for sure. Over two. <laughs> <laughs> over too for sure and look how good it looks man i got a little it, it does yeah. maybe you hey maybe you wash it for the next episode and that's like your one percent for the week wow. as you come on here i'll wash it right hair. before we get on here and i'll let it dry and you'll see what i mean yeah <laughs> all right so what's what's mike's weekly one percent gonna be what's his I, challenge i think that he should i think that he should put the phone away i want to see if he gets done i just want to see if he has an hour an phone. hour an hour before i'm in the sheets an hour. So whatever you think you're going to go to bed, you plug it in, separate room, set your alarm. You don't look at it for the rest I'll of the I'll plug night. it in across Can't, the room. My living yeah. room is huge in my back room here. I sleep all the way in the couch, which is like in the corner, like it's big sectional. I'll plug it in across the room actually where I'm sitting right now. By, on this little bar table I have in this back room. And no, and you can't, and you can watch as much TV as you want, but uh, you can't like look at your wife's phone on social media. I don't care to ever look at her phone. But I'm her just so, saying, you can't be like, hey, let me is, look, hey, hey, let me look something up real quick, you know? No, her her social media is all hair tutorials, so I don't I don't care to go on there and watch it. Yeah, but all right, deal. I'll, uh, I'll do that. We'll get this going for the next week, and then I'll touch back and see if it changed even just my sleep patterns and helping me fall asleep at night. So, I but, almost, I'll bet the house on it. All right. All right. <laughs> well, without further ado, uh, we're going to send it over now. Uh, we got a really good interview for you guys. We're really excited about it. So um, we're going to transition into that with our interview with Jared DeMichael. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we now welcome on the inaugural guest to the Chasing Edges podcast, the man, the myth, the legend, RIT legend, the best goal in RIT history, associate head coach for UMass Amherst, the defending Division One national champions, Jared DeMichael. What up? What, what, what an intro, Dirty Mike. I, I don't know if I can take claim to the best RIT goalie ever. The uh, I think I'd put you at the top of the list, but maybe I'm no. biased. No, no, no. Oh, it's boy. definitely you. Um, D. Mike, thanks for coming out, man. It means a lot to us to be our first guest here on Chasing Edges. Um, first and foremost, how have you been? How's the family? You welcome the baby boy this year. You got two kids now, so how's that been? No, it's been good. It's been a, a it's been different, but different in a, in a good way and stuff like that. I think it's changed me. Uh, as a person and things like that, but I'm, um, I'm super lucky. Uh, my, my unbelievable wife, Kara, I met her at RIT back in the day. Um, good Western New York girl from uh, Buffalo, New York, but uh, no, Joe, uh, jo, my, my second baby was born Jordan in the middle of the NCAA tournament. We, uh, yeah. we just finished the regional against uh, Lake state in Bemidji. And he was, he was born that night. We, I got back off the bus like around 1130 or plus or minus got home and my wife and I were talking about things because she was 39 weeks pregnant at that point. And we, whatever, I hopped in the bed and I was like, hey, like, I know you said you want to be induced, but like, you know, Frozen 4 is coming up. Like, come on, I can't miss out on that. And she was, she was like, I'm not getting induced and you're not going anywhere until this baby's born. And totally understand and respect that. And then yeah. literally five minutes later, she like popped up out of bed and she's like, 
something weird's going on. And I'm like, Kara, like literally I'm exhausted. Like was up all last night watching video. Like yeah. it was a long weekend. Like, I just want to go to sleep. And she's like, no, something's weird's going on. And then she took like three steps, got into our, our master bathroom. And it literally sounded like a faucet of water was just coming down. <laughs> yeah, water <laughs> broke. And, <laughs> wow. um, and then we were off to the, the hospital that night. So it was, it was pretty cool. And it was, it was good timing too. Cause that was the same time as, uh, North Dakota and Duluth going into like five or six overtimes or whatever wow, crazy so they did. Just, so I was just following that I would have on my phone, like because of COVID, I couldn't go into the hospital with her no until way. she got admitted through. So oh I was actually God. in the car in the parking lot for like two or three hours by myself, but I was just following the game on my phone. So it wasn't wasn't awful. I was following the game on my phone and like texting her while she was waiting to get admitted in. Did you have to bring your daughter to the hospital too? Was she like sleeping? No. In the so the, the timing was great. Um, my in-laws from Buffalo were down visiting because they knew Kara was close to, to right. popping. And uh, they were still there that night when I got back from the, the regional. And I just like went into their room. I'm like, hey, uh, Kara's water broke and we're going to the hospital. And they're like, all right, we'll take care of Paige. Oh, my Jeez. God. What's I'm the What's the, the protocol on like if the baby comes mid game, you know, you, you hear people like pulling out of tournaments and whatnot, like baby one, you got to go baby two, you're, you're sticking around for the game. I, I, I mean, I think, I think it's a game time decision for everybody. Like I know uh, my, my boss coach Carvel here, I know he, he missed the birth of one or he had to like fly back. Like he was with Ottawa and I think they're on like a West coast swing and he was like out on the trip and then he had to like whatever rush to the airport and get back i think his wife was like in the middle of labor when he showed up um but i think i uh i know whatever i know you guys know cal i know he told the story when he was going to have a baby and uh tortorella was like i missed the, the birth of my kids and i and, and they're fine cali like be at the hockey game or something no yeah, way yeah. Really? It was something like hey you can't have kids in the playoffs like you gotta you gotta plan accordingly you can't yeah. miss games yeah. playoffs well, the, i guess is one thing but the, that's still the, crazy the uh we actually my, myself and he, he was our assistant now he's the head coach at maine ben Barr. but we both actually we both drove down our own cars to bridgeport which is like an hour and a half from uh, amherst here but that's where the regional was but his wife was pregnant with twins so twins come a little bit earlier than a regular baby but we both drove down ourselves in case we had to drive back north to get back to the hospital um Jeez. for that for that trip so he actually when we went to the frozen four he stayed back until like wednesday and drove out himself to pittsburgh um and luckily his wife they didn't have the baby till like a couple weeks after the frozen four but we were kind of like all hands on deck what we were going to do like our, our volunteer was going to be ready to like hop on the bench and how we were going to handle things like we had a lot of different things coming and going but it all it all worked out Man. for the best talk about adversity for the boys in a whole different <laughs> level than just the game yeah when, it, when are you going to have some kids dirty mike october 29th my wife's due let's go do you know the sex or no yeah having a baby girl good for you I'm a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. You just did the water. You just told me about the water breaking. I'm now <laughs> maybe terrified a little bit my, more. My, my sister's third baby. They didn't even make it to the hospital. She had like the baby in her, oh. her bed. So no, usually it's the first one that takes more time. And then after that, like they come pretty fast. So you're, you're going to be good. Oh my God. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen for the first one. That'd be terrifying. <laughs> but um, all right, D Mike, before we uh, oh, look at we, this guy, what's this guy doing here? Before we jump into this, um, and kind of get into you know the whole coaching career and UMass and your story with coaching. I want to touch base a little bit on just your career at RIT. Um, I mean, you had this is true whether you don't want to believe it or not. You had the greatest season singly for a goalie in RIT hockey history, and you were part of the best team in RIT hockey history. So, what was that Frozen Four run like for you guys? And kind of what point in the season did, could you get that sense like this team has something special brewing? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that season was, was unbelievable. Um, I'm still, and I've said this a few times, like incredibly close with just about every single guy on that team. Um, I think at my wedding, like almost like the whole team was there. The, the basically the whole coaching staff were there was coach, coach Wilson and Hills and Insulaco, coach Jermaine, they were all there. So that was really cool. But, um, no, I mean, I think they're, um, uh, that chip on your shoulder mentality, I, I think for us at the time at RIT, we were really trying to fight through and make it to the NCAA tournament. We had some good regular seasons and blue cross. We couldn't kind of like get over the hump. Um, but I, I think we, we played so well in the regular season. We just had so much confidence. Um, and it wasn't whatever a word back then, but like we had a swagger to us. Um, ironically to our, our team model that season was fear the streak. 
and it was fear the streak because tigers travel in streaks like fish travel in a pod and wolves travel in a pack tigers travel in streaks and we had two like significant streaks that season winning streaks and everybody thought it was like oh these guys are so cocky like they wrote fear the streak on the back of their t-shirt because like they're on this long winning streak or right. like no like we actually started the season zero and five on a losing streak so it's not <laughs> just because we're winning um but i i think we we had um the year before we we had a tough overtime loss in the Atlantic hockey playoffs. And I think that left like a bitter taste in our mouth, but I think we kind of felt like we had figured it out. Um, and a lot of guys had great seasons from um, obviously Chris Tanev now playing in the NHL, but Dan Ringwald was unbelievable on, on the back end. Alan Mazur, another senior teammate of mine had a, a huge senior year. Um, we had six really, really good defensemen. Our forward group was yeah. awesome. I think Cameron Burt led us in scoring. But uh, we had great leadership in Dan Ringrald, Andrew Favitt, Sean Murphy, Stevan Maddock. Um, and we just felt like whatever, top to bottom, we were a really good team. And um, even early in the year, um, we had, like I mentioned, we started the year 0-5. And, and I was actually thinking about this the other day. But um, we've, I kind of felt like we had to do a little bit of losing to learn how to win. And we had very tight games to, to start the season that we lost. And then we actually got – swept out at air force which was a tough pill to swallow we were duking it out with them for the regular season championships at that time and after we lost both those games then our team really responded and i think we went on a heater for like nine or ten games um we ended up losing it when we uh i think we played niagara right before christmas oh. but um once we got once we got through the atlantic hockey tournament like we had a ton of confidence and then when we got to the tournament like i I mean, we, we were pissed off with how much we were disrespected by other teams and the media. And um, I was a little bit of a, an idiot in the press conference stuff. You, but I, by the way, before, not to cut you off, that is single-handedly one of the best lines ever dropped by I got to hear it. I, don't, I haven't heard this. Do you want me to tell it? or You can before, you can tell it. d Mice gets at the podium and he said something along the lines of, you could call us underdog, overdog. You could call us Snoop Dogg for all we care. We're here to play hockey and to win. <laughs> That's games. great. Yeah. It was unbelievable. No, but the oh, like when, when we sh when we showed up at the regional, like they didn't even have like a locker room for us. Like they had like our our, our names for the interviews were like wrong. They like they couldn't even say like Rochester Institute of Technology. But I, I think we used it as fuel to motivate us. And I also know too, like whatever. I, I was lucky that they were like, hey, Jared, do you want to do these interviews? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll do them. But I knew the other guys that were there with me, they would come back to the team and they were like, like you should have said, heard what like D Mike said and like how loose we were. And I'm, I mean, I would assume it was the same way when you were there, Mike, but like our team was always relaxed, confident, had a ton of fun. I think that comes from the coaching staff and extends yep. down to the players. Um, and, and we knew we had nothing to lose, but the, the first game against Denver, like everyone was like, Oh, like they've got this player and that player. And they were so good. And they were number one or number two all year. And we were like, well, like, look who we have. Like, we have really good players, too. And our team was older. We had been around the block. We had a ton of confidence. Yeah. Um, and in that game, we we found a way to win. And then the next night, the next night was awesome where um, I think, too, like UNH kind of, I don't want to say disrespected us, but maybe they looked past us a little bit. They saw, oh, hey, RIT took down uh, Denver. Right, we now we just got to, yeah, we don't have to play Denver. We just got to get through them, and we're going to the Frozen Four. And our team, we were super confident and we were like, we just came out, we played and I think we won that game six to two. Six um, two. But I remember in the third period, there was like five minutes left. It was six to one. And like Chris Saraceno, uh, who was still a really, really good friend of mine. Like it was, there was a face off and like him and I were like, are we really up six to one right now? Like, where are we going to the, we're going to go on frozen four. And then the guys are like, <laughs> sweet. shut up. Like we got to finish the game. Like, let's go. <laughs> Um, but it, it was an awesome group, just everybody around the team. And obviously RET is a super special place, but like we had the same bus driver, same routine. Uh, we, yeah. we watched Entourage that year, which was a great thing to kind of bring everybody together. So did we, that must be, uh, that's a Jeff Siegel tradition. Yeah. Um, Jeff, obviously like Jeff's unbelievable human being, just everybody around the program was just so on board. And, um, Mr. Spiati, our AD, was an unbelievable. Mary Beth Cooper, like all those people. And you don't realize it uh, as a student athlete, but now as right. a coach and seeing it here as UMass, like you, you, you can have 
uh, really good coaches and good players, but you need just as much support from the administration and the staff and the community and everything like that. So no, that was, that run was unbelievable and wish you could go back in time, but that's not possible. Yeah. And you ran into a, a juggernaut in Wisconsin. I was looking up, they had like Stepan and Schultz and McDonough and Jake Gardner. I mean, that was a serious team when you guys got to Detroit. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think uh, if you look up their hockey DB or elite prospects, I think like five of their six D have yeah. played like a significant amount of time in the NHL. So it's um, an unbelievable stat. Yeah, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, and like everyone, like everyone, like whatever said their D with their strength, which it was, but they were like, yeah, they don't have much offense up front. It was like, well, like you had like Stepan and Jeffrey on who won the Holby, and Mike Davies was a really good player on that team that's had a really good career in Europe. So it's not like the forwards were slouches either. Um, right. So then, all they whatever the, as much as it pains to say me, the probably the 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 better team definitely won that game. Um, but it was still a cool experience, even when RIT when we were done, like the next night, all the RIT corner crew fans were there, and they were still chanting like RIT in the final minute of the BC Wisconsin game, which was just yeah. awesome. That's sweet. Um, yeah. That's yeah. good stuff. I want to. I I want to ask. I want to jump in here. Looking at these stats to pump your tires a little bit too, you got a you had a two oh nine goals against average and a nine twenty one save percentage. Like those are some pretty unreal numbers. What what kind of attention were you getting individually coming out of that season? Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think because of how our team played, obviously that that opened up a few doors. Um, and I whatever I ended up signing in Washington system with Hershey and things like that, and. Um, I mean, we all we all talk about the process and focusing on the process. And I had some individual goals for myself, and I always wanted to play pro hockey and get the opportunity. And um, it kind of like, I, in a good way, like my my goals kind of elevated as, as the season progressed. Like at the going into the year, I was like, hey, like I, I want to play in the NCAA tournament and hopefully get a chance to play pro hockey in the the chl and then we started to play our team played better and better i was like oh maybe i can play in the echl and then when we got to the frozen four i was like well like you know like maybe i can make it all the way to the american league or the nhl or something like that so um at that time like atlanta cocky and didn't totally get all the respects that it deserves because it's an unbelievable league um and obviously tanny's really changed that where you can move on and, and move on to the nhl um and we were lucky we had like obviously Tanny's played a ton of games in the NHL, but uh, Dan Ringwald's played in the American League. Uh, Cameron Burt's played in the American League. Um, Tyler Brenner's another player that played in the American League from that group. So like from Atlantic Hockey School, that many guys to move on and play that high of a level, like it's it's pretty impressive. And um, obviously whatever, we had, a, we had a really good group and it opened up a lot of doors for all of us individually. Yeah. That's that's really sweet. So what, so you had five games with uh, Hershey, played 26 with South Carolina. When did you uh, did you always want to know that you wanted to eventually switch into coaching, or what was that what was that transition like for you? Yeah, no, it actually I'd want to say like halfway through my first year of pro, um, it really kind of hit home how much I valued the time and effort that the coaching staff put in at RIT. Um, but even like coaches like our, our strength coaches like Nate. Um, that type of stuff, like, and even our, our equipment manager at the time, Jeff Siegel, like just had a really strong, um, deep relationship with those people. And I was like, you know what, like, I, I think I would be decent at coaching. And I remember I, I reached out to, to Wills and I was just like, Hey, like I'm thinking about potentially doing this. Like maybe if you think I'm going to suck, you could just say that, but like, I'm, I feel like <laughs> when I'm getting done, get playing, like, I think I might want to give this a kick at the can. And my, my second year of pro, um, I was kind of bouncing around from spot to spot. I was packing up my stuff and driving somewhere new more than I was stopping pucks. And I reached out to Wills and I was like, Hey Wills, like if, if you see of any coaching openings that you think might be valuable, like keep me in the loop. Like, I don't know how much this pro thing's going to last for. And um, got super lucky that Nazareth was starting a division three program in, in Rochester. And the, the head coach there was George Roll who had recruited me to Clarkson back in the day. And everyone says all the time, like, don't burn any bridges. And both George and I still had a, like a good, healthy relationship and obviously hadn't seen him in quite some time. But I, I just basically sent him an email being like, hey, I'm bouncing around from pro to pro spot. But if you need an assistant or looking at an assistant, like I'd have interest. And um, I made kind of Rochester my home base when I was going bouncing around from spot to spot because my, 
my girlfriend, my now wife, Kara, was there. And one of the days I just had uh, lunch with him at the uh, the uh, Bill Gray's Regional Iceplex. We went to uh, Billy G's and had a nice uh, burger. And he was just <laughs> like, hey, the, the job's yours if you want it. And I was like, well, I kind of want to give this pro thing um, a little bit of a chance. And he's just like, yeah, if you want to do that, go ahead. And I think in the maybe a month later, I was on the two more ECHL teams and I called them back. I'm like, you know, maybe I should give this coaching thing a, a start. And um, it, whatever, it couldn't have worked out any better. George was an unbelievable boss, let me do a million different things, um, allowed me to grow, allowed me to learn from my mistakes and still have a, like a super good relationship too with all the, the Nazareth kids there. So to, to build a program from scratch, it, it, was, it was challenging, but it was, it was a great way to, to crack into the, to the profession. That's sweet. I got a super random question. I know this is off topic here, but I've never had a Bill Gray's burger. Is it that good? Oh my God, you're missing out. <laughs> I'm, totally. I'm being serious. I, there's even one down the street and I go by it all. I think this, the outside, I actually just got a facelift, but I just have never had one. What? What did you just say? <laughs> the outside, Next question. The outside oh, yeah. needed like like it wasn't it wasn't looking that good. It could use. Some, oh, the outside eyes. of the building needed a yeah. facelift. I thought you said I just got a facelift, but I never. Oh no sure no no! <laughs> so that I think that's what steered me away for a while. But yeah, yeah never had one. No cur right. curly fries are sneaky good too. I think we don't. I'd always get like a um, a blue cheese with bacon. Ooh, it was ooh, not ooh, healthy ooh. whatsoever. I mean, th this double chin has grown significantly <laughs> from my playing days, probably because of the Billy G's eating, but that, that, that place, yeah, no, they've got really good burgers. I might have to, I might have to go dabble. Yeah. Um, but I got another question too for you. I got a, I got a few written down here, but I've kind of dabbled with the idea too of, of, uh, you know, coaching when my career comes to an end here, but I've always kind of been, deterred a little bit by having to climb the ladder again you know obviously the grind of playing and the, and the gr grind of I mean your ceiling is obviously you still got a ways to go who knows who knows where you'll go with your coaching career there but what's the what's the difference in in the grind when you were playing and the in the grind while you're coaching obviously the physical the physical part of it but uh if you could just kind of compare the two a little bit yeah no I mean it's not as uh maybe physically taxing where obviously whatever you can have a few more cheat days with what you're eating and how still you're still grinding on the road and stuff though. That's no, physical. no, no, you, no, for sure. And I mean, like I'm catching a 5 a.m. flight, so I'm leaving my house at 3 a.m. You know what I mean? And right. I've got two young kids, so I'm not getting a ton of sleep or that stuff. But I mean, um, you learn fast how much you enjoy it and there's a, there's a multitude of different directions that you can go in coaching. You don't just have to do college coaching. Like a lot of prep school coaches have great jobs and midget coaches have great jobs and high school coaches have great jobs. And obviously pro hockey, there's a lot of different ways that you can go. Um, but I, I remember whatever, one of, the, one of the first recruiting trips I went on, I think I was in the rink from like 8 a.m. to like 11 p.m. And uh, I called George Roll, who was my boss at the time at Nazareth, Nazareth and I'm like, talking about all the guys I watch and this and that. And he's like, wait, like you were just in the rink for like 15 hours. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, who cares? Like, let's talk about these players, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, he's like, you need to like go and chill. And I'm like, no, like I'm totally fine. I'm like, I don't need to chill. And he's like, he's like, I think you're going to be halfway decent at this. Like a lot of people would be miserable right now. And he's like, for you're sure. literally like bouncing off yeah. the wall. So that that's like, I would say, are you sport, still like that? I, I still really enjoy. I mean, maybe I'm just a hockey like nerd, but that's I cool. still enjoy going to the rink and talking about players and, and that type of stuff. Um, I mean, you, you talk about the grind. So this past year when we were playing in the NCAA tournament, like we're very big on staying in the now, focusing on the process, not looking a day or two down the road. So when we got to the regional, we literally just focused on Lake State. Like what do we have to do to win this game against Lake State? And then that night after playing Lake State, we were playing Bemidji. Most people thought we were playing Wisconsin, but we had a, some film on Bemidji. So that night as a staff, we all watched multiple games. That night I watched that night. I mean, I barely slept, but that night I watched our game against Lake State. And then I watched two games of Bemidji previously. So I watched three games that night. And then Jeez, man. we coached that game. And then whatever, my, my son was born that night. So like that was might have been one of the most tired situations I've been in, in my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's college is college coaching's different and different in a good way. Where like, 
as a coach, you're wearing a lot of different hats. So like maybe you're doing skill development, maybe you're doing some whatever work with the guys in the weight room, or maybe you're watching video, or maybe you're doing recruiting, maybe you're on the road recruiting, maybe you're watching hockey TV, maybe you're doing stuff on Instat. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. And um, I don't know, I've always been a firm believer, like if, if you work hard and you have fun, like you're, you're gonna have success, you're gonna find a way. Um, and whatever people like to say, like division one athletes, it's a job. Well, it's only a job if you look at it from that perspective. Like I've not once thought my, like playing for RIT, that was a job. Like I loved every second of that, that just like my job right now, I really don't look at it like a, a job. Like I, I love coming into the office. I love going to the rink. I love being around my players, meeting new people. Um, and also conversely too, like it really helped when I was at RIT, you had to do two internships to graduate. And I actually did one with Kodak um, the summer going into my senior year. And I had to do 40 hours a week. Um, the people that I, were, what I worked with were unbelievable. But like literally after two weeks of sitting in a cubicle, I realized fast, like this job isn't for me. Like I need to be out and about being with people. Um, just a nine to five isn't going to work with me. And some people do it and they're very successful for me. Like I, I would have flopped on my face if I was in a cubicle all day, every day. I just, I, I was, I, when I was in the cubicle, I was like on YouTube looking at hockey, like researching mm -hmm. how I could get better, how I could, whatever. I was just all about it. So, um, but I, again, like I said, there's a multitude of other people that that's their sweet spot and they crush being in a cubicle and they would kick my ass at that job. But for me, it just, it wasn't for me, but it was valuable that I got that experience for 10 weeks and kind of steered me in, in a direction. And um, I've still, like you said, Cole, I've still got a ways to go and I can still improve and get better. Um, but yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a fun ride so far. I couldn't imagine myself in a cubicle. I, was, I, would, <laughs> I would go nuts. Me neither. I, I can barely, I can barely imagine you sitting here while we record this podcast. Exactly. I mean, that's tough enough, but, but that was, that was a really good sell on, uh, on the coaching, coaching. Game for sure. I mean, I might have to venture into that Avenue when I'm done yeah. here. No. And you, you mentioned climbing the ladder, Cole, like I have a, whatever, a bunch of buddies that reach out like, Hey, I want to get into coaching. And it's like, well, most of the times when you break in, you're volunteering for a few years or you're making like 10,000 to $15,000 for the year. So like, are you going to be able to do that? Is that financially feasible where, I would say most people with a college degree are starting off, they're making significant more money than a volunteer position. So you, you do have to pay your dues. There are a few people that step right into really high paying jobs. And those people are very, very fortunate. But my, myself, I had a like a stipend at Nazareth, um, but I did get my master's paid for, which was huge. But we have, we've had volunteers out here at UMass that have, um, we try to move them on and help them get jobs where they want to get jobs. But that's why I say like, Hey, like maybe you just want to volunteer and coach a triple a team or a house team. Um, it doesn't just, whatever, you don't just have to coach in the NHL or in pro right. or in college. There's a lot of different ways that you can go and whatever's going to kind of work for you. But I, I agree. I mean, I think for me, I wasn't just going to be able to go cold Turkey from hockey. Like I had to be involved somehow and getting the coaching was the way that I kind of stayed in it. Some guys, some guys love men's league. They can just crush men's league. Men, men's league. Was that, like, yeah. I was done having people come down on breakaways on me every day. <laughs> For sure. That's a good gig with the masters there. How did, did, was that offered to you or did you kind of, uh, I'm sorry guys. I'm <laughs> Nader's, Nader, Nader's getting ready to jump in this guy. Yeah. Okay. He's, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, man. What about the masters? No, you're good. Go, we'll, we'll talk. What else you got? No, no. <laughs> no I wanted to chat a little bit. So, the whole, this whole part of this episode, we're talking about the other 99%, like the house you need to build before you put the shingles on. I've said a bunch of times in this episode, and, you know, we're going to explore the 1% edge, but like you guys know that the foundation as needs to be there before you start looking at the little things. And for me, one of the biggest parts about that is character as an individual and culture as a program. And it's been so insane watching your program go from, you know, what was it Zoomass, you know, I, not the best reputation to being a competitor in such a short amount of time and winning the whole thing. And I have to imagine that your culture and the people that you recruit is a major pillar of that. So, you know, how much of a focus do you guys place on character and their lifestyle outside of just talent? 
And then what are some things you guys have done there to build a culture, which I I'm assuming is a huge part of your success. Yeah, no, totally. Nate. And we, we say this every single day. Like we say culture is king and um, a strong culture can be a skilled collection of individuals any day of the week. And that's, and that's how we win games here. Um, we don't have obviously over my shoulder here, Kel McCarr is obviously a freak stud player and, but he's also a freak stud with his character and his ability to want to get better and who he is as a human being. Um, but we don't attract whatever the NTDP kids and the, the million first round picks, like that's not how we're going to win. And we literally like, we're totally okay with it. Like we, I think we know who we are and, um, We've we've won some games here, but it's not going to change our identity as a team. Um, but I, we talk about our culture and our values on a daily basis, um, and it starts with Coach Carvel. Um, I was obviously lucky enough to work with him at St. Lawrence and saw how he did things. Um, and we basically brought the blueprint here to UMass and tried to elevate it and improve it to be a whole nother level. And um, you have to, like you said, the foundation – um, and Carve does an unbelievable job like this, but he, we have to surround yourself with really good people from the players to the staff. Um, and it's not just our coaches. It's our strength coach. It's our trainer. It's our equipment manager. It's our sports psych coach, our volunteer, our director of hockey ops, um, our analytics team. Like all that stuff is just as valuable of having really good players because um, – like our, our analytics team, we have a, a woman here named Katie Yates. She's unbelievable. She'll be in the NHL in no time. But like literally like she makes me a better coach. She makes our players better players. Um, so we're always trying to find that advantage and things like that. But obviously there was a, a big culture shift. And we said it was kind of a culture cleanse. We had to change things the first few years. But we put a huge premium on character. Obviously, you have to have some level of skill. But if you have high character, you find a way to be successful. Um, and I'll never forget this. It was our, our second year, and we had a kid uh, committed to us, and we were talking about him potentially maybe doing another year of junior hockey. And our, our mental skills coach was just in the meeting with us three coaches, and and the, he just, like, he was keeping his mouth shut when we were talking about the kid, and then he just chimed in fast. He's like, hey, let me ask you guys a question. Like, what's this kid's character like? And myself and our other assistant, Ben, we we're like, honestly, like we're not being biased. Like this kid's as close as you can get to a 10 out of 10. Nobody's perfect, but he's close. And this mental skills coach was like, just bring the kid in. He's going to be fine. And we're like, literally, like, are you sure? Like, like he could maybe could value from doing it earlier. He's like, no, bring the kid in. If he's, if you guys say he's that high, he's going to be fine. Um, now that kid, he's been a part of two national championship games. He's now one of the captains for our team. Um, and literally, like the first day he stepped on campus, we were like, you know what? We're really happy we brought this kid in. Um, but we, uh, we, whatever. This probably isn't the best terms, but we we say no dickheads. There's no dickheads at, at UMass. Yeah. Um, and on a daily basis, and we talk about this, and our mental skills coach works on us with this. You can we we talk about controlling three day things on a daily basis. It's your attitude, it's your commitment, and your effort. There's a lot of things outside going on, and. A lot of things happening, but you can control your commitment, you can control your effort, and you can control your attitude. Um, and really, we really hone in on that. And um, I think we've done a, a halfway decent job of locating the, the right kids. Um, and I'm not saying they're the best players, but they're the right kids for us. And they're the right kids where they want to get better, they want to improve, they want to win. They're really good people. They're actually really good students. We've actually had the, the number one male athletic GPA here for the last three years at UMass. Um, but I think, again, it starts with Coach Carvel. He's got those high standards, but he also lived to those high standards. I'd like to think myself as a player, like I, I live to those high standards. And um, I think about it all the time, the coaches in, in college and that I had, the good ones and the bad ones. And I try to take the best attributes of the, the coaches that I was around and the, the poor attributes of the coaches that I was around. I try to avoid doing those things, but obviously nobody's perfect. Um, but yeah, no, we're, we're very, we have a lot of pride in our culture here and we feel like it's, it's our, it's our kind of our equalizer when other teams want to check over a bunch of draft picks and a lot of talent. Well, our, our talent's going to be our culture and let's see how you do. Yeah. I, that's awesome. Go ahead. 
Well, I, I just got to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. So, so I, I feel like um, obviously that's super important, but there's got to be times where you're recruiting and you see an absolute stud that you know you're foaming at the mouth over you want him to come but you're hearing little rumors about his character or his you know his ability to be a good teammate or whatnot like how how far are you guys willing to let the leash out or, or bend a little bit to to bring him in or is it just the second you hear one bad thing he's done we don't great we, question so we will research a player like that but if we hear from multiple people that it's true we don't we don't bend, not once whatsoever for character. It's, That's crazy. It's, it's it's not it's non negotiable. So again, hey, like we, we have kids on our team that are four GPAs, and we have kids that are not four GPAs, and we'll research. Hey, like why was this kid not that strong of a student? And um, Carve said this to me when I first started working for him. He's just like, hey, if if somebody's not taking their schoolwork serious, like what else aren't they taking serious? Like are they right. not taking the weight room serious? Are they not taking practice serious? Are they not taking games serious? Like usually guys that are pretty dialed in as students are going to be pretty dialed in in practice and on the ice and in the community and in the dorms. And I mean, I don't, I don't think he's wrong in that assumption. Obviously there, there are guys that sometimes um, make mistakes. I'm guilty. I'm far from perfect, but like, how do they respond to that? Um, but like, if, if you're selfish, a bad teammate, uh, not good in the locker room, not good to people around your rink. Like we, we just delivered, we literally, you're, you're, like I said earlier, no dickheads and you're a dickhead, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, and that's, that's amazing. And I, I give you guys credit for put, placing so much emphasis on that because it's so important. And, you know, I'm sure you've got the big trophy behind you, which obviously another congrats on that, but I'm sure it hasn't <laughs> been all puppy dogs and ice cream on the way there. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty of road bumps from here on out. Right. So when, when you bring in a good character kid and then you potentially have something go on, whether it's in the dressing room or, you know, socially outside of the rink, like how have you guys seen that be pleased between the guys on your team like because that's old school hockey you line them up you bag them whatever the case may be like we know that kids are different these days and you know how have you seen that pleased internally because of the character kids you guys have on the team yeah no i mean um we, we talk about this here at umass and we feel like the the best teams are the teams where the players take over the, as the values and the identity and the culture, just as much as the coaching staff. Um, and you have to have whatever you're, you're the best teams are when you're your best players, you're whatever leading goal scorer, you're starting goalie when they're just as bought in as whatever the eighth defenseman or the healthy scratch forwards. So um, it's grown and it's, it's still growing here. I do think we've had some really good leadership here our last few years and a lot of guys have had to, to pay your dues with some losing and things like that. Um, but we like to hand off the reins to our players and Hey, what, what do you guys think about this? Like we, we had a, we, I, whatever, we had a tough decision this year in the frozen four, our, um, our goalie who would hadn't lost a game um, since January, he was out because of contact tracing did not play the frozen four game. Um, so our other goalie who's, arguably a very good goalie, one of the best goalies in the country. He hadn't played a game since the middle of January. He was forced into playing. Um, he played unbelievable. Yeah, be because our other goalie was out because of COVID. Our third string goalie was out because actually because of COVID too, and our student equipment manager had to dress as our backup goalie. <laughs> um, but after that game that night, we had a discussion as a coaching staff of what we were thinking of doing. And then we brought the captains into it the next day, and we were like, hey, this is what we're thinking. We want to know if like your guys position and we want to have the same support and be on the same page with you guys. And the captain saw it the exact same way as us. And, and we went back to our goalie that had played most of our games the second half of the season. Um, and I'm not saying whatever, we made the right decision or the wrong decision, but that was a super difficult decision. But we had a lot of mature leaders on our team um, and we looked at it was what we thought was going to be best for the group. But um, when it's way it's it's much better when things are policed in the locker room and there's an accountability from the players in the group. Um, and we we talk about the and I'm sure you probably read the book, Nate, but legacy about the All Blacks and the New yeah. Zealand rugby team. Um, 
Like they, they, they like to handle things from within. And obviously sometimes as coaches, you got to kind of help them out and steer them in a certain direction. But when the players are steering the ship and they're all on board, like it's, it's a hard thing to stop in a good way. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. I want to, uh, I want to jump in. So circle back a little, when you first get to UMass, those first couple of years, obviously you're building the program. Um, you had five wins year one. And then, you know, you, you move up a little bit more, you, you up the ladder, you, what did you have 17, I want to say in year two. And then when did you kind of know going into year three, like, okay, this team and this program is, is something special. That was a year with Macari won the Hobie, correct? Your third year there. And yeah. you guys got all the way to the national championship game. Yeah. When did you kind of know? No, to, be, to be honest with you, Dirty Mike, I, uh, I personally, I felt like we underachieved that second year. I, I thought we could have won more games. I'm not saying that we were, um, like whatever hockey's champions good or NCAA tournament good, but I, I thought we could have won closer to 20 plus games. And I, I think we kind of used the the youth of our team as an excuse. And we had a ton of talent that I thought we could have gotten more out of. But at the end of that season, just seeing how the group had grown, um, we, we had good players coming back and we actually had a pretty solid freshman class coming in. So we were, we were very optimistic about our group. And I want to say maybe like, a week or so, maybe a week or two into our first few practices, we were like, we've got, we've got a really good team. Like we've got, we've got two good goalies. We've got good depth on the back end. Our, our forwards, we, we have some difference makers here. Um, and I mean, whatever. We also had two, like not a lot of people knew about us and we still had that. I mean, we still have it now, but like that, that chip on our shoulder mentality, we were very lucky we went out and played Ohio State, and at the time, Ohio State was number one in the country. And I think everyone's like, "Yeah, Ohio State's going to sweep." Like, UMass is up and coming, but they're not there yet. And we beat them pretty handily the first night, um, and then the second night we lost in OT. But our group right away were like, "Hey, like, that's a really good Ohio State team." Like the year before, they were in the Frozen Four. They're probably going to be an NCAA tournament team again. Like, we're we're not that far off. So. Um, no, I mean whatever. Nate said it earlier. You got to have those those building those building blocks, those benchmarks. And um, again, being honest with you, it's really not that hard to go from five wins to seventeen. Like it's hard to stay whatever thirty plus wins. Like that right. that is that is a legit challenge. And that's what we've been dealing with here the last few years. And we're gonna hopefully, if we continue uh, to get lucky, that's what we have to continue to deal with. Um, as whatever, we've got more of a target on our back, but that's a good thing. That's a challenge. We're going to get people's best and that's what you want as a, as a competitor, as an athlete, like you want to, you want to face everyone's best, you know, like, that's why, I mean, I don't know. That's why, that's why I coach. Like I still have that, those competitive yeah. juices. I still am an absolute pouty little kindergartner when we lose. And when we win, I'm like freaking a little leaguer celebrating. I'm just as happy. <laughs> Obviously behind closed doors, you see that in person, I'm freaking stone face killer but then when you get home behind closed doors like i got a huge smile when we're winning and um that's part of the reason too why coach you enjoy the winning the the fruits of your labor you know yeah and obviously we don't want to we don't want to take up too much of your time team Mike. we appreciate you coming on and being on for this long with us but we got to touch on the national championship before you go um for those who don't know, obviously, if you don't follow the sport of college hockey, but UMass won the first national championship in program history last year. And I want to just kind of touch on going back, how much and how big of a role do you think losing in the national championship a couple of years ago? Obviously, the following season gets canceled because of COVID. So this year was the first tournament since you guys had lost in the national championship. How much did that kind of play a role into, you know what, we got there, we got a taste of it? Now we kind of know what we need to do to get over that hump and to ultimately win your first national championship as a program. Yeah, no, it, it was helpful. I know, I, I know, I said it earlier. Sometimes it takes some losing to learn how to win. Um, RIT legend Dan Ringwald said that, um, and that's that's what it took for us. But um, Carve, one of the things that he does really well is he's great at self-evaluating, not just his, himself but also our program. And we sat down after losing, and we were like. Not just not just what we did wrong on the ice, but what what did we do wrong after the game, the game before, and how we handled recovery, and how we handled practice, and the meals, and the hotel, and things coming and going. Like let's really go back and dissect this, and what mistakes can we clean up? And I think that was helpful for us this year, getting back to the tournament. 
Um, we had been around the block before. Um, and obviously it was, it was huge when we played Duluth who had beaten us the last tournament, in the national championship game. And they, they totally owned us. Like they were clearly the superior team. We barely had the puck. We barely got out of our D zone. Um, in the, in that national championship game, they were, they were clearly the, the better team. And obviously there was a bitter taste in our mouth after that game. And then to get back and to play them. And we were without our leading goal scorer. Yeah. Carson just right. Is that yeah. how you yeah. say it? Yep. A good Western New York boy. Um, yep. And then we were also without Phil, Philip Lindbergh, our goalie that had been playing the majority of our games. Um, Jerry Harding was another player that had been a, become a really reliable role player for us. Um, and Henry Graham was, is one of our goalies who um, was really valuable in the room and he helps our culture. So we were without those four guys going into the national semifinal. Um, and I, I like telling the story too. So when we first found out that those four guys were going to be out, if, if any of you guys watch Jocko Willick, well, Will and Nick, I'm butchering his last name on YouTube, or he has a podcast. Um, there's a short clip on there for like three minutes, and he just talks about when something's going poorly, just say good. How, like, how are you going to make it a positive? How are you going to deal with it? So Coach Carvel, when he called us to break the news to us about being without those four guys, Coach Barr and I and him were on a three-way call, and he like told us all the news, and I just said back to him, good. And like <laughs> they started busted out and like um and that's how we took it. And we and we made it kind of a rallying cry, like, hey, we, we're we're without these four guys. Let's find a way. Like, how strong is our culture? And Duluth yep. has an unbelievable team, an unbelievable program. And we, we got lucky that night, but we used it as a rallying cry. Like, like, like let's get the band back together. Um and that that game too, like we did not play great. Like I thought they were clearly the better team for two plus periods. And but, overtime, uh, though, overtime was one of the most dominating performances I've ever seen a team play at that high level of a game. Yeah. You guys, I don't even know if they touched the puck in overtime, which was yeah. how dominant you guys were. No, it, I felt like the very early in the game, I felt like our guys were kind of watching kind of how we were a couple of years ago. Um, and both myself and Coach Barr, like we started to get a, a little yippy on the bench with the players, like, let's go, like get, getting into them a little bit. And we, we do that from time to time. And then after the second period, Coach Carvel came in. And he's like, hey, like, I got this. Just take a deep breath. I'm going to take care of this. And he blistered the guys. But he, he did it in the best way. And you could tell it brought everyone together. And I think we really kind of hit home, like, hey, we're without these guys. Like, let's find a way to get this done. We were here two years ago. And we've had to live with this for the last two years. Like, you want to live with it again? Um, so, I mean, it, it was special. I mean, most of the guys on that team – um, we're at the, the frozen four a couple of years ago. So to find a way to, 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 to knock that door down, it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. And obviously with the COVID year and everything like that, um, some people were like, Oh, like you guys sacrifice so much. And I, I feel like that's kind of like making something negative. Like you don't, you don't sacrifice anything. Like if you love it, you're passionate, you find a way to get it done. I don't think our guys sacrificed a thing. They, they, they yeah. loved that they found a way to, to earn that championship. I don't think they would have gone back in time and been like, Oh, like, you know, maybe I, sh whatever we had to get tested three days a week. Like that just became part of our routine and having to wear a mask and having a social distance and all that stuff. Like if you want to use that as a, as an excuse and a crutch, you can, or you can use, Oh yeah, whatever. Just normal part of our day, everyday life. we got to deal with these masks, got to deal with getting tested and sticking this up my nose. Hey, whoop de doo Like let, let's find a get, we get away and find a way to win and, make this all worth it. If we're going to go through this, let's make it worth it at the end of the day. And at what point during that uh, national championship did you kind of think to yourself, wow, the, you know, we did it. You, Coach Carville, I know you said Ben Barr, and the players that you kind of built that culture around, at what point were you like, you know what, we did it? Because you guys did have a dominating performance in that, in that yeah, game. I was going to ask that too. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think towards the end of the second, like um, I think St. Cloud was just deflated. Like I thought they actually had a really good first. And we just got some bounces. Um, and then the second, they started to bring it again. And then we, we scored a couple couple more goals. And our team was pretty is pretty strong defensively. I, I thought we had pretty good habits and details, how we did things as a group. So going into the third, um, and also, too, just walking in the locker room, going like in between the second and the third, like seeing our guys, like you, you could tell that they were just dialed. Um, yeah. So the, the third period, I, I think once we had a good start, um, 
we whatever we, we knew where it was going to be at and you guys might have heard the story too but we, there was the last tv timeout with like three minutes left car brought the group in and he was like hey we we've got three plus minutes left to finish the job but finish the job and you guys are national champions and we're never going to be together in the same spot ever again so like look around at each other look at this group i know you guys think i'm probably crazy right now but you guys have done so much for yourselves and for each other soak this in finish the game the right way and you'll walk together for the rest of your lives um and the guys obviously they, they finished the job and um it was it was awesome i mean obviously hopefully you get to taste that again but you never know when you're going to get back because it's super hard and you got to have a lot of things kind of fall your way to to get there Fuck, i got fucking goosebumps that was incredible <laughs> that yeah was that's sweet insane insane but uh d mike's uh, on behalf of you know cole and nader thank you so much for coming on and doing this with us it's been a pleasure uh, it's been a great time. Went a little longer than we wanted to keep you, but I think that was just, you know, some good flow of conversation. But thank you for being the first guest on this episode for us, and uh, best of luck this season to you and the boys. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, I just good luck. Thanks. Being around you guys, I can just get the Roch Vegas <laughs> Muchir's <laughs> model rub off on me. So You're good to see all you guys. Hey, <laughs> thanks, d Mike. <laughs> thanks, d Mikes. And for everybody that listened, uh, we just want to thank you guys for tuning in to episode two of Chasing Edges. Um, on behalf, again, of Cole and Nader, I am Dirty Mike, and we'll be back next week with some more. Thanks, everybody.